Hello, one and all. Bienvenue à tous. If you're turning in live, thanks for making time for us on your busy day. If you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for stopping by. Whichever way you're watching, welcome to Post Media's second season of Driving into the Future Roundtables. Today, we're tackling how Canada can become a leader in factory manufacturing. Sorry about that. For electric vehicles. I'm David Booth, and I'm the senior writer for Driving.ca. The transition to electrification is picking up speed. Many countries, including Canada, have pledged to ban the sale of internal combustion engines by 2035. Some automakers have stated their intention of stopping development of piston-powered cars as soon as 2028, and a few have even pledged to eliminate gas engines from the lineup even sooner. All in all, it's a massive shift. Now, even if you think those goals are unrealistic and that the 2035 cutoff date is too ambitious, and to be honest, there is good argument for such skepticism, electrification is hugely important to the automotive industry. Whether EVs account for 25% of the market share in 2030 or 50%, the electrification of the passenger vehicle represents a paradigm shift in the production of cars. The important question for Canadians then is how do we come, become a part of that revolution? How do our parts industries, one of the biggest employers in Canada, become a part of that supply chain for the manufacture of electric vehicles? How do we entice battery manufacturing plants to our shores? Are our advantages in resources and clean energy enough to attract the huge investments necessary? How do political pressures, like US President Biden's promise of a $12,500 subsidy for EVs built only in America, affect our ability to attract the battery and EV manufacturers to our country? And does our government understand that the time to act is now and that Canada needs to match the urgency of other countries in showing that we want to be a part of this electrification revolution? Helping us answer these questions are Scott McKenzie, Senior National Manager of External Affairs for Toyota Canada, Daniel Breton, President and CEO of Electric Mobility Canada. Welcome back, Daniel. Joanne Kiriazis, Senior Policy Advisor of Clean Energy Canada, and Flavio Volpe, President of, Can of Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association of Canada. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Before we start the proceedings, let me welcome all our viewers and inform them we will have time to answer your questions at the end of this discussion. Okay, guys, uh, what a time to be discussing the future of the automotive parts industry in Canada. Transition to electrification is accelerating, and if Canada is to have any hope in becoming a part of that transition, it is going to have to move with a speed that we haven't seen before. So let's see how we're positioned for this grand adventure and what we can do to move it along. Uh, Joanna, I'm going to start with you. What are the advantages Canada has to offer? for someone looking to establish a battery manufacturing plant in Canada? Is it simply because we have more plentiful resources and minerals? Is there more than that that we can offer? What else might Canada possess that makes it such a great Canada to produce clean energy batteries? Thanks, David. Uh, so yeah, Canada ranks in the top five countries in terms of its battery supply chain potential. Uh, you're right that critical minerals are a big piece of this. Uh, EVs are more mineral intensive than combustion vehicles are. And so the fact that we have access to a lot of those critical metals and minerals like lithium, cobalt, nickel, and graphite is a big plus. Uh, second, we're next door to one of the largest uh, auto markets in the world, the US, uh, that's a big plus. Um, these strengths combined with our high skilled uh, workforce, uh, our cutting edge battery research and innovation ecosystem and our obviously strong auto sector uh, make us a very good candidate uh, to lead on battery production. And then last, for auto and battery companies like BMW and uh, British Volt, uh, who are looking to reduce the carbon footprint of the products that they're selling, uh, Canada has an abundance of clean electricity to power um, lower carbon manufacturing operations and, and help those companies produce clean EVs and batteries. Oh, I didn't know we were fifth. 
um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in potential. That's actually very good news. Um, thanks very much. Um, Daniel, I think some of our viewers might still be a little confused. Um, we in the business, we talk about batteries and battery cells and sometimes don't differentiate enough between the two. So can you give our viewers just a quick rundown of what a battery cell is and what types there are, like cylindrical, pouch-like? Um, and are battery cells easily shipped around the world? And how many cells there are in a typical battery? Just a background of what goes into a battery and what we can build here and what we can't. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we can build any type of battery that we want, but it depends on what direction battery manufacturing uh, will, will go towards. So let's take a look at two examples, the BMW i3 and the Tesla Model 3. So if you look at an i3, you have 96 battery cells. These cells are combined into one module and eight modules are put together to put it into the vehicle in the form of a battery pack. If you look at a Tesla Model 3, which is a cylindrical cells, you have, uh, let's say you have a standard range plus Tesla Model 3, you have about 2,200 size lithium ion cells. And these are in, put into four uh, longitudinal models that each contain a group or a brick, which means that you'll have about 3,000 cells in 96 groups of 31. So that's a lot of small, you know, those batteries that look like double A batteries. There's a lot of that in uh, lithium ion batteries for uh, mo Tesla Model 3. But now if you look at chemistry, I don't know if you know this, but recently uh, Tesla has changed it, the battery chemistries of the Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus, going from lithium ion nickel cobalt to uh, lithium iron phosphate. Yeah because they're cheaper, they're more stable, but they are less energy dense than regular lithium ion batteries. So for all sorts of reasons, but one of them being the fact that the minerals that you put into a lithium ion battery, a lithium iron phosphate battery are not as rare and are cheaper. It is a good argument for some manufacturers to switch towards that type of battery. And other than that, uh, we're coming out with solid state batteries in the years to come. And actually, Toyota is one of the players in that field. Okay, thanks. I mean, it, it, it's, and, it's really. And, and on the second question you want to ask. Me, uh, okay. Is it, is it easy to move them around? I mean, actually, right now, if you look at battery plants around the world, more than 90% of battery plants, of big battery plants, are located either in China, Japan, or Korea. So that means that most batteries come from Asia. And now the U.S. government sees that and understands that. But uh, this is something that should have been part of the discussion 15, 20 years ago, but they just woke up to that fact. And the European government is waking up to that fact as well, saying that we don't want to end up having the same problem of a battery supply that... Uh, we've seen with oil supply in the past, for instance, because it could create geopolitical incertitude. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Scott, so Daniel explained the minutia of what goes into a battery, but um, batteries are huge. Once all those 3,000 um, cylindrical um, uh, battery cells are put into, a, into a, one enclosure and then you have all the um, management uh, hardware as well, they're pretty large. Um, can batteries be assembled anywhere and then shipped to assembly plants or are they best built near an assembly plant? As one of the largest legacy automakers in Canada, why don't you walk us through some of the issues that constrain how, where and why we might build future factories in Canada? Thanks, David. And, uh, you know, Danielle's right that, uh, you know, currently most of the batteries used in, in production are coming from other places, whether it be Asia or otherwise. Um, you know, apart from Tesla, battery electric vehicles, uh, you know, in terms of a portion of sales overall in the market are, are still relatively low, although they are climbing. Um, you know, when you're in low volume, shipping batteries over long distance is a little bit more manageable, but as the uptake increases, um, and you start building a, a higher proportion of, of your vehicles being electrified, um, you know, the scale is going to change everything. And at that point, 
um, you're going to want to have that battery supply as close to you as possible because, uh, you know, when you're building the scale, like in, in the case of in Toyota's operations in Canada, uh, we make around 500,000 vehicles a year. If they were all fully electrified, whether it be battery, electric vehicle, or plug-in hybrid or hybrid, you know, they would each need a battery. And shipping that amount of batteries, uh, you know, across the world would be prohibitively uh, expensive. And you're going to want something a lot closer to Thanks very much, Scott. Um, and, 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 and I think it's very more important that our, our, our viewers understand that, uh, that the constraints that are different for a battery cell that Daniel explained, and of course, the entire battery that Scott explained. Um, yeah, I just, love sorry, you. David. Yep. You know, and just build on that. You mentioned that batteries are, are big, and they are, you know, especially a full-size battery electric vehicle, um, but they're also incredibly heavy. You know, a, a full-size battery, you're, you're looking at something that weighs in the order of a 1,000 pounds. And, uh, you know, shipping those through traditional methods and for us in just-in-time manufacturing, you know, we're using trucks. And, uh, you know, shipping batteries via truck is pretty challenging because you're actually going to weigh out a truck before you would cube it out. Um, in which case, it's, again, building the case that you're going to want them as close to you as possible. Thanks very much. Flavio. The Auto Parts Manufacturer Association of Canada is on the cutting edge of the efforts to get manufacturers to build uh, batteries and other EV components in Canada. What is Canada's best foot forward in attracting this new kind of assembly plant? Uh, what, if any, battery manufacturing plants are already planned for Canada? Uh, do these plants need completely new facilities or can existing facilities be converted? And lastly, what is APMA currently doing to uh, to attract these new um, facilities and these new manufacturers? So there's a lot of questions in that one question, David, but let me just... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> just unpack a little bit here. Um, you know, this is uh, this is early days in in uh, battery manufacturing around the world. And, and uh, you know, Scott alluded to the fact that we're really talking about right now less than 5% of current sales. So less than 5% of, of the market currently drawing... Uh, from companies that are already in the business, you know, an LG, uh, an SSK, or companies like uh, BYD that are uh, Chinese companies that have been in and out of, of Canada, southwestern Ontario, for uh, 12, 15 years now. Or companies like uh, Total uh, doing a joint venture with a major automaker like Stellantis and saying, look, on ACC, uh, where could we and should we go? This isn't there are no charities in this business. You know, they all report quarterly publicly traded. No one's going to build up a, a factory on spec. So one of the things uh, that's very important for them is to, to match up with companies. You know, you call them legacy automakers. The legacy automakers and the new automakers, although I will say Toyota is a kind of funny one in the middle because um, I think we're all talking about this because somebody decided to launch a Prius about 25 years ago. And it, uh, what can we predict is the vehicles are going to make, where they're going to make them, where do they currently make them, what are they going to replace, and what are the, uh, the, the, the motivators, the in incentives in those markets to be able to predict how many batteries we need. And then based on that, how much market share can you get? So, you know, we're, we're very excited to be talking to companies like Strombolt or British Bolt, New Ventures, uh, great technology, looking for looking at what they think is, look, if the battery market is going to grow by 50 fold, you know, 2 million battery electric vehicles a year to 100 million in, in uh, the mid 2030s, you know, at the, at the highest end of that, uh, that prediction, then uh, where can we grab market share? Who do we need to do it with? About 10, 12 years ago, the, the German manufacturers had gotten together on diesel and, um, they shared uh, a technology, uh, a bunch of them, blue tech, diesel. You see a bunch of, of uh, different brands carry them around. What they said was there isn't enough to support for uh, one company's, uh, there isn't enough orders from one company to support a model, but we can share it. I think we're going to see some of that in automotive, uh, in batteries. Um, you know, outliers to that, of course, is General Motors has, has uh, gone all in on their Altium brand and you know, a lot of them are saying, we're going to go with our own chemistries. That's the recipe. That's where the milk gets in the coconut. But the reality is, if the curve looks more like this, then they're going to have to share in this space. If the curve looks like this, then you're going to see some partnerships come out of that. 
We've got some, we, we launched Project Arrow, which is a all Canadian uh, designed, uh, engineered and built um, concept vehicle that uh, is, is meant to highlight that we can do all of this in Canada. And one of the discoveries we had in this is about 150 companies I didn't even know existed in this country in that value chain. You know, and we represent 300. So you can imagine, I didn't think the gap was that big, but there's a whole bunch of companies that jumped out in the battery space that were very interesting to me. And and, and a couple of them, uh, one of them does a little bit of uh, business with uh, Toyota is Electrovia in Mississauga. We've known Electrovia for a while, but what's important with them is uh, their manufacturing footprint is zero carbon. So never mind their prismatic cells and the energy density and the things that are important to a customer. Uh, when we talk about corporate responsibility, they, uh, companies like that might become a little bit more attractive to companies like Scott's. Hey, by the way, we're not... You know, we're not giving you a really clean battery. And by the way, uh, burning coal to, to uh, process it. And then a company like Summit Nanotech out of uh, Alberta that is still in that kind of a proof of concept stage on the battery, but really interesting, taking the brine water from oil and gas and extracting lithium. Well, if you could do that predictably, both in terms of the quality of the, the lithium and the quantity, uh, there you start to understand that uh, there could be a national uh, buy-in uh, industrially on uh, our, our battery future. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I, it's interesting that even Alberta can get in on the deal, at least a little bit. I, I'm not sure they're going to have much more. In fact, uh, that's what I'm going to ask Joanna next. Uh, we've covered a, a bunch of uh, stuff on manufacturing, Joanna, and, and um, Scott brought uh, forward some uh, important logistical issues about the transportation of large batteries. So, where does this leave the um, prospect of battery plants to be located in the future? Is the field wide open? Uh, do, do Quebec and Ontario have the edge? Is it Quebec's clean energy that's the bigger advantage? Or is it Ontario's base of auto manufacturing? Um, in terms of the actual battery assembly, do any of the non-traditional provinces um, uh, like out west that don't have any auto manufacturing right now, do they have a hope in this? And uh, are automakers already talking to the various resource companies looking to source materials that they'll need to build batteries in the future? Uh, so, you know, the vast majority of, of battery demand over the next decade is going to come from passenger vehicles. Uh, and so, you know, as, as Scott alluded to, we are expecting to see battery plants being set up as close to vehicle assembly plants as possible, which makes Ontario uh, an obvious choice for where we may see future battery plants in Canada. Um, but Quebec is uh, is a competitor here. Um, they that province has done a lot to. Uh, proactively build out its battery industry. Um, it's also home to electric bus and truck manufacturers uh, like Nova Bus and Line Electric, um, as well as an electric snowmobile manufacturer, Intega Motors. Um, so there's some, you know, there's a market there too. And then Quebec, uh, of course, has uh, clean and very cheap electricity, which has been a huge draw. Um, and so, you know, those advantages have have attracted Stromvolt and uh, British Volt, who both announced that they uh, plan to set up shop in, in Quebec. Um, so anyways, for these reasons, I'm, I certainly see um, Canada, central Canada as being the center of gravity for for Canada's battery industry. Uh, but as Flavio started to allude to, I think that uh, other provinces have an opportunity to feed into the value chain as well. So uh, BC is already home to, to some companies that lead on marine vehicle batteries. You know, Corvus Energy produces uh, batteries to or battery technology that, that goes into electric ferries. Um, Summit Nanotech and another Albertan company, E3 Metals, is, is doing that uh, extraction of lithium from from oil field wastewater brines uh, and then on it in atlantic canada you know nova scotia's dalhousie university is home to um one of the world's top battery researchers uh and his team is working with tesla on various r d projects so um yeah well i do think that we're going to see a lot of activity in quebec and ontario um this really is a, a pan-canadian opportunity um when it comes to building out our battery value chain Thanks. Thanks very much. Even Nova Scotia, huh? Well, maybe we're better off than uh, than the many people think to, to to be a part of this. Man, Nova Scotia. Um, okay, Scott. Uh, Toyota is, of course, the biggest automaker in the world. More importantly, it's one of the um, uh, manufacturing powerhouses here in Canada. 
So who better to ask about all the consideration a manufacturer will have to make to take into account before it builds a battery or even an electric vehicle assembly plant in Canada? I'm not looking for any state secrets here, uh, Scott. Uh, I know I'm not going to get them. Um, but <laughs> can you walk us through what the considerations are for a large company like um, like Toyota, uh, how large does Canada's EV segment have to grow before we get um, some uh, an EV assembly plant? Uh, how lo- how large does um, the segment have to grow before we might get a battery assembly plant from Toyota, uh, or not Toyota, but anything? What, just walk us through the general considerations, okay, Scott? Sure. Um, you know, Canada is obviously a very important market for Toyota. Um, you know, it's one of, uh, it's certainly in the top 10 in terms of markets globally that we have, but it's important to remember that about 85% of our production in Canada goes into the U.S. You know, our, our operations in Ontario, um, you know, we, we produce cars for Canada, but uh, again, the lion's share go into the U.S. So it's really the North American market that's going to drive this and it's going to be overall product demand. So product demand. So, uh, you know, Battery electric vehicles, you know, we, we announced uh, BZ4X is going to be coming out uh, this coming year. We'll have other uh, fully electric offerings uh, coming into the market soon. It's the demand for those individual models that will really uh, necessitate uh, local battery production. And, uh, you know, being able to get a critical threshold, typically we'll get around 50,000 units of production. Um, in order to justify localizing something. And uh, I think you're going to need that mass at an individual model level in order to justify, uh, you know, local batteries. In other words, what you're saying is the, um, uh, like a, a popular brand, like a RAV4, something that is one singular model that will take one set of batteries will have to have a large volume before, before you can move production locally. Yeah, exactly. So for instance, if, and big if we were ever to have a, a fully electric RAV4 again, because actually we've done it twice in the past, um, but if we were going to bring that to market again, um, you'd probably have a mix of different powertrains, at least initially, where you'd still be making hybrid vehicles, but also plug-in hybrids and battery electric vehicles. And that's actually a good place to be because you can manage uh, market fluctuation uh, a little bit better if you're, if you're making all three of them. But for a particular product, um, you know, for instance, a, a fully electric RAV4, just as an example, uh, you would still need that critical mass um, for that specific uh, powertrain in order to justify local production of batteries. Thanks. Thanks very much. Flavio, uh, I think I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. Um, Stellantis has announced that they have a huge battery plant planned for North America. And I know that as early as you know, uh, the uh, beginning of this year, uh, the Windsor Essex folks, where Stellantis has a huge base of manufacturing, uh, uh, put uh, have been putting a lot, uh, an enormous effort into getting a battery plant uh, in its uh, locality. Um, can you give us any hint to what's happening here? Um, uh, have we got any chance to land such a big whale? Uh, uh, I know smaller plants are coming, but that would be a huge one. Uh, any updates? Anything you can tell us at all? Well, I think the hints are in what you said and what Scott said. And so the, 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 the biggest draw is that uh, Stellantis committed to an electric platform in the, in the Windsor Assembly Plant, which is a great great story. It's on the border. It's been uh, operating since the 1920s and it's converting to full electric. And so kind of what Scott's talking about is these decisions could get uh, their proposition from what's the volume of a single vehicle needing those batteries. And so, you know, Steve McKenzie's doing a great job down at the Windsor Essex Development Commission. And I know he talked publicly about um, having a few big fish on the hook. I'll say this. I've seen the hook and I've seen who's been on it and there's no bluffing there. Uh, it is for us, Delantis, you know, and I'm not talking on their behalf, but for us, Delantis, the, the Windsor Detroit area is very important from a production volume point of view. And so being able to do something in that area is, uh, would also have an eye to uh, supplying other lines on the other side of the river. I like to always say that, you know, we've got a better proposition on the Canadian side, uh, especially when we talk about some of the things that uh, Joanna talked about, which is make the cells 
in Quebec. Great energy mix there, great energy pricing and great resource mix. Send them to Ontario to get packed into batteries that Daniel described, and then use Ontario as a base to serve the, the Midwest. It is not out of the question that what you're talking about uh, comes to fruition, but I'll tell you, it's sitting on my notes here, um, probably name uh, two or three opportunities that are very mature at this point, uh, that uh, we could miss them all, but we're certainly in the game on all of them. So, there, well, I mean, that's as hopeful a message as I've heard, Flavio. I really appreciate it because, you know, there's some negativity about it. But So we're at least in, the, certainly in the mix on the Stellantis one, I think is what you're saying. Well, I think I'm not saying anything out of school here. I think we heard Carlos Tavares say, I'm looking at two plants in North America and Canada could be one of them. And so you're hearing it from Paris uh, uh, on the record uh, from the guy that matters uh, the most then, uh, then you know, take it at face value. Well, if we don't get anything else out of um, out of this whole panel, just that positive message is already worthwhile. Thanks very much, um, Joanna. The elephant in the room is the Americans' government wish to apply by American rules, namely that the subsidies uh, for EVs will only be available to electric electric vehicles built in America, and that. Part of the incentive is even only available to EVs built in America by union employees. What's this going to do for Canada's prospects for new manufacturing of of EVs and battery plants? Uh, What can we do about it? Uh, Most importantly, is our federal government doing enough to either get this taken off the table or get a Canadian manufacturing uh, exemption? Or uh, what is the latest um, data on this Buy American plan for electric vehicles? So happy to start us off. And then I think some others may have uh, some something to say as well. Um, so yes, certainly the CV tax credit that is uh, that was just passed by the House in the U.S. is on a lot of people's minds. Um, it does pose risks to Canada's EV and battery manufacturing prospects, because if there are companies who are on the fence between Canada and the U.S., um, this could cause them to choose the U.S. in terms of where they'd like to uh, set up shop so that they can benefit from the full tax credit. Now, I think I I also want to just raise, you know, on the flip side, out of the about 87 EVs that are expected to be available in the U.S. at the end of 2022, only four would likely qualify for this full tax credit. So it's hard to know. It's hard to know truly how big of a deal this is. Um, and, and, I, and I guess that just means, you know, there are, other, um, there are other investments and other opportunities that Canada could still capture. You know, there, there are a lot of automakers who are being left out of these um, tax credits. In terms of what we can do about it, uh, so I think the best thing uh, Canada can do is to continue to remind the U.S. of our long history of collaboration on autos, our deeply integrated supply chains, which have benefited both countries and have helped the North American auto market or auto sector compete globally. Uh, disrupting those supply chains is going to have negative impacts on on U.S. companies and workers as well, like the the auto parts suppliers that supply Canadian assembly plants. Um, And I think it could also um, potentially raise the cost of EVs for consumers, including American consumers. Um, I think we should be reminding the U.S. of uh, Canada's mineral resource strengths. You know, it's one of the few things that we've got and they need. Um, And then, you know, yeah, sorry. And and just to say, if we're going to be collaborating on that part of the supply chain, the critical minerals part, then, then we should be collaborating downstream too. Uh, and then um, finally, I think it was uh, it, it was good for Canada to threaten to bring a claim under the the USMCA agreement um, because this this measure probably violates uh, trade law. And so that was that was sort of good as a more aggressive move on Canada's part. I personally don't think we should engage in a tit for tat um, uh, trade war with the US on on this measure because our market is a fraction of the size of theirs, and and I just I don't think we would win. Um, so last, in terms of uh, if the government has done enough, 
I think that the feds, you know, they did get on this issue. It, it rose to the top of the agenda um, in the recent Three Amigos summit with the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, so, so I think they got there. And the question is just, did, did they get there too late in the game for it to actually impact any of the decision making uh, south of the border? Flavio, have you got anything uh, more to add uh, from the uh, parts manufacturing side of things? Scott's smiling because I've spent the last uh, week in Washington and the last two months on this. Um, if Joanna's right when we take the 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 look on today, you know, uh, uh, how many vehicles are affected? What's the size of the market? Scott's talked about how small the market is currently right now. And so the American defense of this discriminatory uh, action is, well, it's a small part of the market and it's really early and we're just also want to get good union jobs. But the reality is that the uh, proposed legislation and the regulations say that in 2027, exactly. the entire $12,500 quantum will be used only to apply to cars made in the United States. That for the Canadian uh, automotive proposition is a death knell. Uh, if you have a vehicle that costs $37,000 and, uh, you know, Donald Trump uh, threatened to raise the price of the Canadian vehicles by 25%. And certainly, you can see where the buyer is going to uh, go. But what Joe Biden is saying is, well, let's drop it 33%. And we think this is worse than, uh, than, um, than anything that was threatened by a crazy president who yelled at the moon. This is a rational actor using a congressional instrument to do something specific uh, to us, looking at us straight in the eyes. So... Uh, there will be a USMCA challenge if it passes, and that's an if. It's got to go to a Senate vote. Uh, there'll be a WTO challenge quicker than a USMCA challenge. And I think one of the things that the feds, uh, I know, are doing, uh, I'll be back in Washington talking to five senators in two weeks. They are talking to our trading partners who are also probably more injured than us uh, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Japan's investment in production, J Japanese companies' investment in production in the U.S., is as big as American companies' production in the U.S., and it's growing rather than shrinking. And there are non-union shops who pay more than the union shops. And they're the biggest importers of new technology into the American market. And so Japan will be there on a WTO challenge. This is going to get really, really messy, really, really quick if it passes in the Senate. And then the question will be, will it pass in the Senate? And unlike the Canadian system, the Americans decide when they're going to bring a vote. They decide to bring a vote when uh, leadership thinks they can win that vote. And we may be, that could be next week, could be February. It could be never if you listen to the uh, senator from West Virginia who's got a Toyota powertrain plant in his backyard. He's not looking after Canada's interests, but he may have um, from his own West Virginian interest, uh, an interest in, in stopping this thing. We definitely need to stop it. End of story. There is no Canadian auto sector if it doesn't have access to the U.S. market, period. Can I wow. jump in? Yes, please. So I would like to remind uh, your viewers that in, on February 24th, uh, 2021, uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau signed the roadmap for a new U.S.-Canada partnership. And I think this is very important because... They wrote, and I quote, the leaders agreed to work together to build the necessary supply chain to make Canada and the United States global leaders in all aspects of battery development and production. To that end, the leaders agreed to strengthen the Canada-U.S. Critical Mineral Action Plan to target a net zero industrial transformation, batteries of zero for zero emission vehicles, and renewable energy storage. So that was signed in February. Here we are in November discussing the fact that because of this Build Back Better plan, we Canada EV supply chain could be really hurt But why what's happening south of the border. So if, we, if they really want to be partner and follow up on this renewed U.S.-Canada partnership, it doesn't make sense. It's a total contradiction. But we have the minerals that they don't have. So I think it's a chip. It's a bargaining power for us that we should use. Uh, I think we should be, we, we would be the laughing stock if we, we did not use that as a bargaining chip uh, regarding uh, US-Canada partnership. And what I'm seeing right now in the US, last week, Prime Minister Trudeau 
was uh, in Washington to discuss many topics, but one very important topic was EV development, EV supply chain. And uh, let's not forget here that what we are seeing from a geopolitical international point of view right now is China that's being very bullish on battery development. They control a lot of the supply chain and most of the refining of lithium, for instance. And I don't know if you remember this or you heard about this, but about a month and a half ago, um, the, there was a Canadian lithium company that was bought by a, US, by, by a Chinese company. And I can tell you that in Washington, that was looked at and they were not very happy because what the U.S. government is saying is for geopolitical reasons, we want to make sure that if we work in partnership with Canadians and the Canadian government for U.S. and Canadian national security strategy, we have to make sure that we don't send all our critical minerals outside of Canada and the U.S. And right now, 99% of lithium that's being extracted in Canada goes directly to China. So there's, it's a complicated issue, but we want to work together. We have to tell the U.S. we have critical minerals, but for strategic and national security uh, considerations, we have to make sure that we can supply our EV uh, batteries and uh, our supply chain for Canadians before sending it directly overseas. So I think what you're saying is um, we have some bargaining chips. We can almost hold the Americans hostage that if they want even want to build their uh, their plants in um, in the states, we have the lithium they need. And currently we're selling it to their biggest competitors. Something like that. It's a bit more complicated than that. But I mean, broadly, it's a bit like that. Well, um, Scott, does does this affect what you already do with hybrids um, in 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 Canada uh, now? Um, could this be a, a something that affects the future? Uh, how does this affect somebody who's actually selling cars right this moment? You know, just building on the comments that were already made. Um, you know, Joanna was right that it, it's a relatively small problem in the near term. Um, further out, it becomes a massive problem. Mm-hmm. Our, our government in Canada has banned, uh, you know, the sale of uh, internal combustion engines, uh, or at least internal combustion only engines by 2035. So, what exactly are we going to make in the future? You know, hybrids are exempted from this uh, ZEV policy uh, in the U.S., so we could keep on making those. Internal combustion engines are are exempted from that policy. We could keep on making those, but none of those are desirable in Canada by 2035. So who are our customers going to be? And, uh, you know, even though this is a small scale problem in the near future, the bigger problem is around, uh, you know, attracting investments. And, uh, you know, this situation creates a lot of uncertainty, specifically for, you know, our headquarters in in, in terms of where they're going to place assets. And uh, I think we need to get that uncertainty off of the table immediately, or at least as soon as possible. Certainly, I, I, I mean, I, I've got to believe, uh, as you say, that um, that um, I, somebody in Japan making large decisions on where to place their future battery plants is looking at this. And until this is resolved, they certainly can't commit to our country. I'm guessing. Yeah, I don't. I don't think uh, we're at the point where that's driving decision making today. But the longer this extends, you know, out into next year, as an example. Um, you know, those decisions in terms of where battery plants are going to be placed are going to be coming a lot closer and a lot sooner and a lot quicker. And, uh, you know, having that uncertainty of hovering over you is not really helpful. Um, so, you know, I'll reiterate, <laughs> the sooner we can get this resolved, uh, you know, the better. Um, you know, Danielle talked about uh, using critical minerals as a wedge. And, and Joanna also talked about, uh, you know, us being a smaller market in the U.S. and, and not having a lot of power. But you know, we've been in this situation before with 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum, and we collaborated with the international community. Like Flavio said, you know, you've got Japan, you've got the EU, you've got South Korea, you've got a lot of large economies out there that are impacted, uh, you know, to the same extent that we are in Canada, and that, you know, they've invested in plants in the U.S., um, and their products are, are basically not welcome under this scenario. So I think if the international community actually, uh, you know, bands together and has some targeted actions, 
uh, on the U.S. administration, I think that's probably your most successful outcome, assuming, uh, you know, as Flavio said, assuming it, it does actually make it through the Senate. And I don't think that's a certainty at this point. Well, um, okay. Well, you know what? Uh, I've done about six or seven of these panels, and I don't think I've ever seen a more universal response to any question or, or, or topic I've ever had to that. So I, I think we can all chalk that up as bad. Um, I, I'm going to switch gears, guys. Um, Daniel, uh, so far we've talked only about using Canada's resources as a way to leverage our way into battery manufacturing. Um, but with all these batteries in the world, how do they get recycled at the end of their life cycle? Uh, the IEEE uh, estimates that just the new car sold last year had 134.5 gigawatt hours of batteries in them. That's a lot of batteries. And we're just at the beginning of this switch to electrification. Um, the biggest uh, battery manufacturer in the world, China's CATL, uh, is already recycling its batteries. In fact, uh, I think they're talking about being able to do enough for 200,000 um, uh, automotive batteries. Is this a lucrative business? And does Canada get in on this? It will be a lucrative business for now. It's not really because uh, the batteries actually uh, last longer than was first expected. So, uh, so it's not an issue for now. And one perfect example of that is that uh, I remember back in 2006, I don't know if you remember this, Scott, but uh, I was in university and I was studying uh, the life cycle uh, impact of uh, the, the, the Hummer H2 and versus the Toyota Prius because they said that the Prius would, would be more impactful to the environment because it wouldn't last as long. And now what we're seeing, whether it's in Fran San Francisco, Toronto, Montreal, or New York, that many cab drivers are actually driving Priuses and Prius Vs because they do last very long. So, so the issue of uh, battery recycling, uh, it's interesting these days. The government of Quebec is working on a regulation proposal where they took for granted that a, an electric vehicle battery is supposed to last approximately 10 years. And after that, they should be recycled. And uh, uh, I would say that there was consensus amongst environmental groups and experts and uh, OEMs saying the, the regulation proposal from the government of Quebec doesn't, doesn't stand a chance to, to work because batteries are built to last a lot longer than that before they send them to recycling. But before going to recycling, actually, there's the reuse part, meaning that the batteries can be reused for a second life, whether it's for uh, energy storage or second use into another vehicle. And as batteries last longer and longer with time, because now we're talking about batteries that will eventually last between 1.6 and 3.5 million kilometers. So if you're talking about 1.6 million kilometers, you drive 20,000 kilometers a year, that's 80 years. So that means that the batteries are going to have to be switched from one car to the other at one point, meaning that the, the recycling of the batteries is something that's going to be further along the way. For batteries for buses, which it's a, it's a very different story because it's very intensive, meaning that the batteries don't last as long, but they get rebuilt right now. Uh, it's happening uh, everywhere in the world because let's not forget that while we're very happy to have about 100 electric buses in Canada, there's more than 600,000 in China right now. So uh, they are way ahead of us, but there are two Canadian companies working on recycling batteries. One of them is uh, Lifecycle in Ontario. The other one is Lithium in Quebec. And uh, both of them are working on technology to make them not only 95% recyclable, but very, very, um, uh, the, the, the business model works very well. So uh, that, that's what we're going to be calling urban mining, meaning that the, instead of going to extract the minerals, uh, north of Ontario or Quebec or Alberta will actually reuse the minerals to put into n another battery. And to me, that's a very important part of the, p the puzzle. Uh, hopefully it can grow. Um, Flavio, we've been talking all around all the various businesses that can be um, part of, uh, you know, the EV revolution. I, I read a report recently that a uh, 
a, a European wide battery supply chain, and that's including everything from resources and battery manufacturing to the battery recycling that we just talked about, could be worth as much as $400 billion a year and create 4 million new jobs. Now, our car market and our industry is nothing nearly as large as the EU's. But have we actually projected out any figures on what's at stake here in terms of getting onto this battery gravy train? Um, yes and no. The Europeans, of course, are, are uh, further up the chain, obviously, uh, in transportation uh, in general. Uh, the Europeans have been leaders in uh, reducing carbon footprints as a target, a regional target, et cetera, um, way ahead of uh, what essentially happens in North America, which is the California Air Resources Board says, you want to do this. The EPA in D.C. says, we're going to fight you. Then we end up doing what California wanted to do. <laughs> and then Canada harmonizes uh, with, uh, with, North, with uh, the Americans. Depending on the president. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. That, that, yeah, that's a whole other show. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the European, that opportunity in Europe, that $400 billion, what that really comes down to is essentially assuming that at some point the entire uh, European output of vehicles is battery driven. And then taking the full value of those vehicles and then saying that that's what the opportunity is. I mean, it may actually be true. Uh, but within that, you know, what's the what's the potential value chain for Canada in a, in the battery supply chain? Uh, first of all, the European market, especially Western European market, is essentially the same as the North American market in terms of production and sales. So, you know, we're looking at the similar quantums. Canada and specifically Quebec, uh, uh, I, I should say, have an opportunity to be one of, if not the the most important node within North America for battery production. Now, there are lots of different ways this can go. Like the, like the 2024 Toronto Blue Jays could be the best team in the league. They've got all the pieces, <laughs> got all the talent. Everybody's young, the right coach, and they'll win. And, and we should look back. We can look back on 2024. I think that's where they can go. But I'm know. sorry, Flavio, but when I look at the Canadians in the last uh, series and now. It's, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> night and day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so for Canada, we've got all the assets. Um, but, you know, it's a conversation I constantly have with the feds and the two provincial governments to say, look, we got everything we need in the ground. And we've got two million vehicles we make a year here. So as a kind of an anchor for an order, who's going to process it. And um, mining companies aren't going to process it on spec. That's a completely different discipline. And... Uh, automotive suppliers or manufacturers aren't going to process uh, the, 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 the critical minerals and turn them into cells and sell them to themselves. And they're also not going to be the ones that build the charging infrastructure. And so there is a whole of government and the whole of society approach here that is where the milk gets in the coconut. If we don't do it, then Quebec isn't going to be a major Uh, player, we will, I mean, in spite of everything that we're all talking about here, we will scoop the dirt, put it in trains and send it uh, over to our U.S. buyers the same way that, you know, uh, mining companies will sell uh, their assets to a Chinese buyer. I mean, in the end, that nobody is a cherry. I, I had a discussion with a federal minister whom I shall not name, but who was very interested in this process and said, well, who are the processors? And I said, well, if you think about Quebec and aluminum, All the aluminum companies that you think are aluminum companies, they're processors. They take the raw materials, they turn it into a usable stock for customers that are Scott, his company, and, and the companies I represent that turn them into aluminum things. So, so we can do what the Europeans are talking about. First of all, the Europeans may fail as well, okay, but they, they're much more advanced in their coordination, uh, transnational uh, uh, and international coordination. Um, and they, re I think they have a better understanding of what's at stake than, uh, than North America does as a whole. Um, and they're also, yes, they may be driven, for example, by Germany, but really, really big players in France and Italy uh, and um, still influenced by the UK. And here it's Sacramento and Washington, and then we're playing 
uh, you know, picking to see who's going to win. We, we may not, I say this to people all the time. We may just, this may just be an academic uh, uh, course subject 20 years from now. We say we could have done this, but we didn't do it. And Quebec is the biggest exporter of raw materials into the EV space, into Nevada or into Michigan or into Tennessee. Um, and the difference will be the type of jobs that we have and the type of future that our children and their children will have. Uh, if we can figure out the battery processing cell manufacturing uh, cluster node strategy, if we can figure out how to create our own market, uh, sorry, to advance our own market on the technologies for charging and supporting of these, then we can make the kind of value propositions to the Toyotas and the Stellantis of the world and say, you do it here. There's that 401 corridor, do it here, and we'll win. I, I could flip a coin on whether we'll make it there. But certainly if we're not admitting that we may lose and understanding just how competitive Tennessee, Tennessee of all places, landed a $10 billion Ford investment. If you had asked us a, two months ago, who's on the list, nobody would have said it. And so we can lose this, uh, and we may lose this. But... Uh, we can also end up right on top, like the 2024 Toronto Blue Jays, Daniel. How do I follow up that with a rational question? I mean, <laughs> seriously, thanks very much. Hello. Um, uh, okay, uh, Joanna, um, I'm going to move on to a question from a, a reader um, uh, who wonders um, a little bit about the sources of cobalt um uh, there's been some news in the world and and uh in the newspapers and everything else about cobalt coming from the congo um and, and there's much less to, i think it's something like two-thirds of all the cobalt comes from congo um and the headlines have been saying about how it's less than i um ideal working conditions are there alternatives to cobalt um uh, does canada have any cobalt resources what uh, is is there anything that you know for people that are concerned and and we should all be concerned about these uh, about these um uh, these news is there something we can do about a canada con contribute to build batteries in a safer and equitable way Canada is home to cobalt, and so uh, we, we do have that resource, and our mining sector does have a, a better track record than, um, than the Congo when it comes to, <laughs> and also, you know, globally, we have a, a relatively strong track record on, on environmental and, and uh, you know, socially responsible standards when it comes to mining. Um, First Cobalt in Ontario recently received, um, I think, five to ten million dollars from uh, in government support to work on a cobalt refinery that would be feeding in battery grade cobalt into the battery supply chain. I think it's still a little while before that actually comes online. Um, but just to echo what Flavio said, I too believe that um, the, the processing and midstream portions of the supply chain are a really big opportunity that um, uh, for Canada, that's not getting enough attention right now. You know, everyone's focused on the battery cell manufacturing plants. Um, so, yes, Canada can uh, help out when it comes to um, feeding more cobalt into the global battery supply chain. And then Danielle mentioned earlier that if you look at trends in battery chemistry, there's a real move away from cobalt, you know, to reduce reliance on, reliance on um, uh, parts of the world like the Congo. Um, and and in, to replace that cobalt, there's a move towards nickel, um, which Canada also has large uh, reserves of, as well as other um, chemistries like iron phosphate. I think there's a number of companies in the U.S. who are trying to move towards that iron phosphate because the, the metals and minerals are more abundant and less expensive. Um, so, so I do think we're going to be seeing um, some alternatives to cobalt. And uh, certainly there is a lot of scrutiny on um, the environmental and social uh, and governance standards related to mining of these materials. Can I say something here about this? Please. This is important because actually uh, I would say that more than 95, 90 percent of the cobalt that's being mined in Congo right now is not being mined by private citizens, whether it's children or adults. It's being mined by big companies using big trucks. So so, so that's a lot of fake news. But uh, I think that there's something important that we need to say as well. It's the LFP battery, lithium iron battery. 
was developed uh, in Canada. And that's something where we can get more and more uh, interest on developing uh, lithium iron batteries. So uh, there's a real opportunity here for Canada research and development, uh, whether it's from Nova Scotia, from Quebec, or from Ontario, but we, got, we, have, we have great researchers in Canada developing new, new technology, solid state batteries, uh, batteries of the future. So when, uh, when Joanna, I totally agree with Joanna, we're looking at new chemistries here in the years to come that will make the battery not only more reliable, but also uh, safer and they will last longer and a lot less time to charge as well. Okay, I got an, uh, some more reader questions. For, and they're all very good, and I I don't go get through them, but I I, I want to go with one of the most offbeat ones, and uh, we'll see what comes out of this. Uh, Flavio, um, somebody named Dave asks: Is quantum computing part of the breakthrough analysis for battery development? I am chair of the York University Quantum Computing for Social Impact, and would like to contribute. I mean, does our abilities in Canada to uh, in, in, in computing and high tech aid in, in, in any of, uh, of this development and furthering this industry? Uh, great question. And then, uh, Dave, you should know that we spent uh, the, the, the supply sector spent a lot of time hanging around the Perimeter Institute uh, and uh, its, uh, its related uh, institutes to, uh, to get a better understanding from theoretical physicists on how we move from electrifying to what are the possibilities with uh, high voltage platforms on managing transportation into a no collision environment. And then also, you know, uh, we're all fighting uh, this, this cost matrix of, okay, what's the best uh, uh, mineral mix for energy density and at the most profitable levels? and uh, the usual plan of attack is to go at it from a pure chemistry point of view and then uh, see what uh, see what the market can bear. Quantum, um, a quantum approach is uh, kind of an advanced level approach that says, look, can we do things in battery thermal management? In the, in the power electronics, it's uh, the, the connection of the vehicle to uh, the, the home or office, uh, the way that we manage them to stretch uh, the range of vehicles. And then in stretching the range of vehicles, these, for example, there's a great German company that we work with that is using uh, solar, uh, uh, solar cells on the roof of a vehicle uh, to um, extend the range by nine to 11%. And it's one of those things where, look, how are we gonna make these batteries uh, work better? in the package that we deliver so that we can actually give people an option. So absolutely, uh, Dave, uh, you and your uh, friends and uh, your colleagues uh, are required for a fresh look here because we're not going to win this on chemistry because we may get the million mile battery and make us a million dollars. What we want is the thousand mile battery for a thousand dollars. And, um, and that's not just going to be in the way that we pack physical items uh, in a chemistry mix. It's going to be in the, the way in which we manage its use inside and outside of that vehicle. <laughs> a complicated answer for a complicated question, I think. Um, Daniel, I'm going to you for one last question and you're going to have to be short, okay? Because we got about two minutes left. I'm getting a, a number of questions and they aren't about battery manufacturing, but they're about batteries in the cold. We know about that here. Um, do uh, Basically asking, do batteries last less um, um, time in Canada because we have cold weather and uh, other questions about uh, is there anything coming down the pipeline that gets us uh, adequate range at the minus 30 degrees that we see here in Canada and you got about a minute oh actually batteries last longer in cold weather so uh, if you live uh, in the desert or in Nevada, there's a chance that the battery won't last as long. Uh, are we looking on, on working uh, to make sure that batteries have better range in cold weather? Well, there's battery warmers now being installed by some manufacturers or heat pumps, which help uh, 
making sure that the batteries will have more range. But from man one manufacturer to the other, it's very different. I did the test in the middle of a snowstorm at minus 25 two years ago in the winter with uh, seven different electric vehicles. And the, the loss of range went, went from 20% for the best vehicle to 50% loss for the worst vehicle. So it's not all equal from one manufacturer to the other. Some of them are better than others. Well, I'm guessing that sooner or later, somebody would like to know uh, a report from you on which manufacturers those are. Um, I I've got to sign off now, guys. Um, I think the conclusion we can make is that Canada has a real chance at being part of the battery revolution and the electric vehicle revolution. Um, the biggest roadblocks would seem to be um, a, a lack of urgency, perhaps, from some of our government officials, and also this uh, regulations in in um, in uh, in the United States. On the other hand, um, it sounds like we have the expertise, we have the wherewithal, we have the conditions, and we have the industries to mm -hmm. excel in this. And really. Uh, that's great news. I mean, it, it, uh, one of the most positive panels I've ever held. So I, I want to thank you all very, very much for joining us. Um, uh, extremely informative. Um, uh, Flavio, Joanna, Daniel, Scott, uh, thanks all for your input. It was absolutely fantastic. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.